Welcome back to another Quick Cup of Knowledge. The man with me today really needs no introduction, but for the few of you out there who aren't familiar, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Dryden, University Distinguished Professor at Kansas State University. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Well, we're so excited for you to share some knowledge. And but first, I really would love to know more about this UDP distinction. Oh, it's an interesting title. Um, it's actually the highest academic title that you can be awarded at Kansas State University. It's, um, so if you've reached a certain level of international renown, if you will, um, your department head or dean can put you forward across campus uh, where it's voted on uh, to re receive that designation. Um, university has been around since the mid-1860s, and I think there's 80-some that exist now. And if you think of all the tens and tens of thousands of faculty have been to the university, far less than 1% of faculty have achieved, have achieved that. So it's kind of nice, uh, it's kind of a longevity award in, in a sense as well, uh, but also you've had to be fairly successful in the area that you've done research and clearly the, the flea arena and the tick arena uh, where I've kind of, you know, especially the flea stuff where I pioneered a lot of that, it really kind of set that off, I think. Well, a tremendous honor and certainly very well deserved. Thank so you. congratulations. Before we shift into talking about your career and, and, and what you've learned over this wonderful journey. Love to though first refresh a little bit on a topic I think that's very near and dear to your heart, which is the misinformation out there about giardiasis. Yes. Just recently at a lecture you gave, it was very eye-opening. I'd love for you to share a few of those important tidbits with our listeners. Yeah, it's interesting because I think the lecture title is the quagmire that is giardiasis. Um, a lot of the issue has to do, and again, no, you know, veterinarians out there aren't at fault for this. We have to, I mean, I, you know, I think it's important to understand because our understanding of Giardi has changed dramatically over the last three decades. Um, and I've kind of lived and breathed that even um, over those years. You know, there was a time we thought all the Giardi was zoonotic, and then we think none of it was, and it kind of went back and forth. Treatments, diagnostic tests, it's all changed dramatically. So there's a few things we need to understand that are very important. First of all, the chances of a human getting Giardi from a dog or cat is almost nil. Um, in fact, the, the CDC published a retrospective study of 40 years. There's not a single case in the United States in 40 years of a human acquiring Giardi from a dog or cat. I know it's going to surprise people, but that's the data. Um, it's really highly unlikely, not biologically impossible, but highly unlikely that any human is going to get Giardia from a dog or a cat. I think that's, that's, that's the first one that's very, very important. Most Giardia that we get, we got from somebody else somehow. Okay? And a lot of times it's water contamination. Yeah. The other thing is when it comes to Giardi within dogs, it's extremely common. 70% um, of all the dog parks in the United States based on a recent study have got Giardi positive dogs in them. Um, the rates of Giardi in the United States can exceed some places over 10% or more in, in domesticated dogs. And so there's a lot of Giardi out there. And in a lot of those dogs, it's not a clinical entity. Okay? So the vast majority of those dogs, 90 plus percent of them have Giardia. It's not even clinical in them. And, and that, that's really a, a, a problem because we, it, we're not over-diagnosing it because it's there, but we're over-representing what it really clinically means in those animals. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, with that being said, though, I think one thing that was in, very important for me to understand for our practice is what's the best test? And I think you broke it down fairly simply, uh, I guess as simple as we can make it in that lecture, looking at those clinical puppies and adult dogs and how are we screening those fecals. Can you yeah. explain more about that? Yeah, I sure can. So in, in a young diuretic puppy, or even a cat for that matter, uh, I think clearly right now we, we know that, that you know, the fecal antigen test that we have available, like the SNAP test, are probably the most accurate tests that we have. Yeah, you know, we can look for Giardia cystotrophs under a fecal, but the data clearly shows that they're not as effective as running the fecal antigen test. Uh, it's not an exposure test, that's a cyst wall antigen. If that test, those tests are positive, there's Giardia there. Uh, you just don't have to scan a slide to look for a Giardia. So those tests are very, very accurate. Um, the other thing you need to recognize is if you effectively treat an animal for Giardia, those tests go negative very rapidly. Uh, in fact, there's actually several data sets now around the world that have shown that those fecal antigen tests will be negative within 24 to 72 hours from a successful treatment that rapidly. Once the, all that Giardia is shed and the feces are clear, the antigen's gone. Um, and that, that's a really important point because a lot of practices, they will treat, come back two to three weeks later and retest, and it's, quote, still positive. No, it's, we don't know that because we're talking about an organism that has a six to eight day pre-patent period. So that dog could have been infected three, four, five times since the last time you treated it. So basically, 
if you're going to treat and test, we actually recommend you test four to five days after treatment, which will surprise most people um, because people think well, those tests have latency. They don't. All good points. You know, we could talk for hours yeah, on we, everything you, yeah, we could. you know, everything you could share with the profession. And unfortunately, I only get minutes. But I'd love to hear some of your words of wisdom for young veterinarians and veterinary students in the area of parasitology. What are some important pearls or pieces of advice that will really help them be successful? Certainly, things that you've learned along the way or that you've taught um, to so many students over the the past few decades. What are some things that will really help them be successful in, in general practice? Well, I, you know, that's a really good question. And, and we can broaden this out even. I mean, from a parasitology standpoint, I think, you, you know, once you get out, you have to maintain currency. I mean, they call it practice for a reason, and I was in private practice. Um, you've got to maintain currency in the discipline. I mean, just look what's happened over the last several years with the advent of the isoxazoline category molecules, NexGuard, Brevecto, Sempirica, Cordelio, and how they've revolutionized flea and tick control and Demodex and everything else. So you've got to maintain currency from that standpoint. And recognizing that resistance is, in, at least in the parasitology world, is inevitable. And so resistance happens within the fleas, within the, within some of the ticks, some of the other parasites. We're now seeing hookworm, and resi- you know, hookworm resistance as well, some heartworm resistance out there as well. You, you've got to go to meetings. You've got to pay attention. You've got to keep up. And if you have questions, contact somebody. So I, I think that's one of the biggest words of wisdom I give there. I think the, on the other side, just a general lesson I like to talk to about them is I still believe this is the greatest profession on the planet. I do. And one of the reasons is we have incredible lateral mobility. If you ain't happy where you're at, move, okay? Um, and I, I mean, I, in my lifetime, I know, you know many, many veterinarians, large animals, small animals, exotic medicine, military, um, industry, academia, human medicine. I know a lot of veterinarians, even classmates of mine, that have moved in the human medicine side. An MD can't come to our side, we can go to their side. So find the area that your passion fits. Um, and again, this may be a bold statement, but I believe a life without passion is a life not worth living. Um, find your passion, explore your passion, and find where that's at. In, in my career, I was a large animal practitioner, 80% cow cat, calf herd health practice, because I came off of a farm, then small animal practice, then grad school, okay? And then I, I came back and I work on fleas and ticks. I'm not pulling calves anymore, right? So find the area that's important to you. I think that's important. And the other one is we all fail. We, we all fail. Uh, we all have times in our lives that things don't go well, okay? And I learned this from my dad. Uh, my, 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 my father taught the Naval Academy, and his, one of his lines was, the only difference between a winner and a loser is a winner gets up off the ground one more time, they get knocked down. Because we've all tripped, we've all fallen, we've all failed. Whether it's a test, it's life, it's, it's, you know, it's a marriage, whatever relationship it is, just get up and keep going ahead. At the end of the day, if you get up one more time, you get knocked down, you're winning. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. They think... You know, the, the life hits them and hits them and hits them and hits them. And then it realize just keep getting up. And at the end of the day, you'll win. I think we're all speechless here because I just want to continue this conversation for many, many days and weeks to come. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have such a limited time left with you as you head towards retirement this year. Um, we've been so lucky to have all of your contributions to this profession. And certainly we are much better veterinarians because of what you've given to us. But what are you looking forward to in retirement? Uh, grandkids. Um, I've, I've got three granddaughters now. Uh, they're life changing. For those of us who are going to be watching this, if you've got grandkids, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, skip kids and go to grandkids. Uh, they 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 are a life change from that standpoint. They give you perspective. Um, and I've had people tell me that once you know I've got an eight year old, a five year old, and a seven month old granddaughter, and people said that I changed. My attitude, even in teaching, my interaction with the students, changed. So grandkids. Um, I'm all, also an avid photographer. Um, wildlife photographer, nature photographer, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting out and doing a lot more of that. Um, in fact, I'm going on a photo safari in Africa this summer, um, and I, I just really, really enjoy that. Um, and then I will continue to do this to a certain extent. Um, I, I have a passion for teaching, and so finding a way to continue to provide continuing educational lectures at meetings uh, for the foreseeable future, I think, is going to happen because um, I don't want to give this up. I, you know. I think, again, passion. I, mean, I, I think you find your passion and you indulge yourself in your passion and you go for it. We're so grateful for this time with you and for everything you've done. And congratulations on a career very well lived and so successful. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.